Welcome to the Holland Market Report. And let me say this, welcome back. And thank you for your very positive feedback about this report that we do for you weekly. Um, today is Monday, August 21st, and we're gonna dive right into the numbers. Robert, here we go. Uh, one year period, Dow up just 2.4, S&P up just 3.3. I'm using the word just now, and we'll get to that in a second. NASDAQ up just four and a half. Year-to-date numbers all still very positive, but not as much as they were. Uh, Dow up four, S&P almost 14, and NASDAQ 27. Not the giddy, exciting 30-some percent for the NASDAQ. Robert Marr, our Vice President of Investments, what do you say to that? Well, we've experienced two to three weeks of underperformance here um, in American equities. So that's why now last week alone, over 2% drop in the S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ. Um, the small caps and international stocks, along with the emerging markets, down more than 3%. So that's why, you know, if you're a regular viewer of this program, you see those numbers kind of coming down a little bit. Yeah, and this is technically what we call a pullback, okay? Now, if you're watching the stock market on television, uh, regular, you know, outlets, um, you know, they'll talk about points and get you all concerned. Um, and But this is very normal. It's not unusual behavior for the market to have 2 3%. I mean, these are what we call anything less than 5% pullback territory. Okay. So um, we'd like to follow up um, on our topic last week, Robert, which was Chinese deflation. And we talked a little bit about that. Now, kind of following up on that, um, I'd like to get Robert's take. We're seeing Evergrande in the news. So um, if we could kind of pick up with that, Robert, and give us the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. All right. Well, Evergrande, um, we heard, we did a few uh, episodes uh, uh, here um, regarding you know ch the Chinese property debt and how indebted their market is and the Chinese equity uh, or property market excuse me is about 25 percent of their economy so a lot larger percentage of their economy that than real estate is here in the United States um, but overall I mean when when it first broke out it was like you know catastrophe and you know David and what I. Was that like a year or so ago, two years ago? Two years ago, yeah. it started, yeah. So um, we heard that they filed for bankruptcy. Evergrande, uh, not ever, China. Ever, Evergrande right now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to put that in context, um, really it's a procedural issue. Um, for the past two years, they've been working with their lenders, the people who have lended them debt. Um, and they've been trying to restructure that debt with their individual lenders for the last two years. And a lot of their dollar notes in Hong Kong and the British Virgin Islands um, are governed by New York law. So in order to restructure those debts in Hong Kong and the Virgin Islands, um, they have to file, it's a chapter 15 bankruptcy um, in, in New York to go ahead and restructure those debts. So in that context, it's kind of a good thing that their negotiations with their debtors are coming to fruition. Now, as far as other developers in China that are under stress as well, maybe this is the green light for them to begin restructuring, which perhaps in the short to midterm is a net negative for the Chinese economy, but in the long run, they're doing what they need to do to restructure the debt. And I think a lot of people would assume that, well, China is a communist country, and you, you know people will naturally say, well, the, so everything's owned by the government, but no, no, these, these are, um, private companies and are they traded on which exchange? I do not remember. But they're publicly traded. They are publicly okay. traded. Yes. All right. So, uh, so there's a normal process. So, e so they are going through the one of the things about the U.S. economy that not all countries have is a very robust financial and legal system. So, they're being kind of hooked into New York. Um, to go through that process is a very good thing because there's a lot of structure and a lot of formality there. Right. And, you know, this is coming from Reuters, a uh, quote from them, since, quote, since mid-2021, companies that account for 40% of Chinese home loans have defaulted, most of them private property developers, end quote. So, I want to focus on that word defaulted. Defaulted doesn't mean that they went out of business, um, although that can happen. What it means is they've missed a payment, which is, yes, that's a negative, um, but that's kind of the scope of the problem or the indebtedness in the Chinese property market. And again, this Evergrande bankruptcy might be giving them a green light to go ahead. And even if they don't do it in U.S. courts, 
within other courts of competent jurisdiction. Makes sense. Um, so China is facing some headwinds. Yes. Uh, we've got the this issue with deflation. Now you're looking at some bankruptcies and defaults. Um, their economy is very investment dependent. And so people look at them and think about, well, they have a huge labor force and they manufacture everything for all of us, that, you know, things we buy on Amazon, it's probably made in China. Uh, but there's a lot more to it. And they're experiencing challenges despite the fact that there's been obviously a lot of uptick in consumer purchases of all those goods and um, you know things that they build. Yeah, and you know you, we might talk about you know the spillover effect of what what spillover is this going to spill over into the global economy? Well, first and foremost, I think it's definitely a spillover within the Chinese economy itself, the property market. Um, as far as the global economy, well, you have global investors of that of those debts. So yes, they're going to be getting a haircut in the bankruptcy procedure proceedings, of course. Um, but right now, I think the spillover in international markets, especially the United States and Europe, is more psychological than tangible. Um, now, can it get worse? Like I said, yes. Um, but one thing I want to focus on, and let's throw up a chart really quick. Um, you know, this is year to date how Chinese equities have done versus IVV, which is representative of the S&P 500. There's a 22% spread in performance. Uh, Chinese equities down negative 7%, whereas, you know, on a total return basis, um, S&P 500 uh, up 15%. So um, that 22% differential, now there's a lot of opportunity. And I think, David, you hit it on the head with, you know, the Chinese consumers and, you know, th they have a huge, very high savings rate. When the Chinese consumers decide to spend again and maybe buy in for a short period of time the rhetoric coming from the Chinese Communist Party like, hey, we're done with regulations, we're easing regulations, we're allowing buybacks, easier investing. Um, when they start investing, you're going to see a surge in, in Chinese equities and it would, it would be prudent to have access to Chinese equities or emerging markets in general. Well, you make a good argument, Robert, for um, diversification, not only looking at um, you know, people being in both bonds and stocks categorically, but also being in within your equity exposure, looking, of course, at your domestic allocation, how much money you've got in different types of companies in the US, but of course, now looking at China and the international market. So, so this makes the case that it's good to have diversification around the world, but also not to say, well, you know, the, the U.S. has kind of had its gains, so let's go looking for opportunity overseas exclusively. So there's a strong argument here for good, solid diversification across the board, um, both in terms of where the money's invested, where those companies operate out of, and also the size of the company and what their focuses are. Yeah, and I may just add to what David said, which was an excellent overview, um, but we don't know when the Chinese consumer right. will, because they haven't been this year per that chart that we just put right. up. Um, we expected them to do so in the first half of this year. We expected lately, oh, zero COVID policy ends. China's opening up. Great. Yeah, it, it's going to be extremely strong first half of 2023. Well, the ones who said that we're wrong, you know, we haven't seen that. So again, market timing, we can't time the market. So having a small exposure to that will work when that happens. There you go. Well, there you go. That, that really puts a, a good wrap on it. When the things uh, that we're talking about do improve, then having some exposure could be a good opportunity. All right, very good. Thank you, Robert. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back, of course, to continue to help you plan stronger.